Hello. I'm hoping that I'm actually live now. My name is Ed Bernstein. Um, if for some reason you are here and you don't know me, uh, and um, I'm going to be reading. I've been reading a Christmas ghost story on YouTube for the last few years. And this year, uh, my friend, Melissa Shaner and I decided that it'd be fun to write our own Christmas ghost story. So that's what we did. Um, so welcome. I'm gonna stall for a couple of minutes to see if anyone else wants to join and listen. Please let me know if there is any technical complications. I'm hoping y'all can hear me. Um, I'm hoping y'all can see me. That's about it. Um, the story is called A Curious Correspondence by Melissa Shaner and Ed Bernstein. Excellent. I am on the chat. I am hearing that. You can hear me and see me. I'll probably start in about one more minute in hopes that uh, anybody who wants to join me can. Um, I'm being nudged. Um, sorry about the screen reflections in my glasses. Um, don't know that I can do anything about that at this point, other than look away from the screen, which seems like a bad idea. So, oh well. Again, the story is called A Curious Correspondence, and it is by Melissa Shaner and Ed Bernstein. That is me and Melissa Shaner. Say hi, Melissa. Unfortunately, she is hundreds of miles away, and the way this is set up, that pretty much means that she can't join us and like read part of the story with me or something. All right. I know. Draw this a little closer, which is actually going to make the glare on the glasses worse. And it will be time to start. A Curious Correspondence by Melissa Shaner and Ed Bernstein, Part the First. Let me be clear. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in them the whole year through, but I'm particularly skeptical of Christmas time ghosts. They're too traditional to be convincing, for one thing, and for another, the nights are just so long. When there are eerie lights in the stairwell and it's not yet five o'clock in the afternoon, it's obviously the refracted light through the double glazed window of a passing pair of headlights. And the noises, with something always freezing or thawing or cracking or melting, and wind causing all manner of racket. If any ghost attempted to produce mysterious noises, it wouldn't be able to make itself heard. My parents had a tradition of reading Dickens' Christmas Carol to my sister and me every December. We'd build a mountain of couch cushions and flop in front of the fireplace to listen. And although as I got older, there were certainly places I would rather have been, it was an important part of the season not least because it was a time when my sister and I could share the same space for an hour or two without poking, or pinching, or otherwise harassing each other. And it's a good story. But Scrooge posits that Marley's visitation is likely due to an undigested bit of beef or blot of mustard. And even as a child, I suspected that this was the truth. I don't go around telling people I'm a ghost skeptic. That's the best way to encourage even the most seemingly sane of your acquaintances to relate their tales of the supernatural, often evidenced by the astonishing sensitivity of their household pets. My cats startle invisible enemies all the time, which I believe is not because my house is full of walking spirits, but because they're cats. So when my sister sent an email at the beginning of December, suggesting we get together on Christmas Eve to read a Christmas carol out loud like we did when we were children. I deleted it immediately. I don't say I wasn't startled. Whoever had written it had Emily's epistolary quirks down rather well, for one thing. 
although presumably that is what ChatGPT is for. And for another, I don't know that anyone would have known about our Dickens tradition, other than Emily and me, and our parents, of course. And Emily had died before they did, more than 40 years ago. That evening, I took down the box of letters and other family mementos I'd inherited when I moved into my parents' house after their deaths. It was Transferring my apartment's worth of possessions seemed easier than preparing the place for a quick showing. And then owning the house had turned out to be worth more than the price of its sale. So 13 years had passed without my doing more than disposing of some old papers and unneeded housewares, installing a high-speed internet connection, and replacing well-worn furniture with items more to my taste. It had been many years since I'd last opened that old banker's box and read through those letters, or even looked at the photos. It's not that I'd forgotten her, just that the box in its place had been sufficient. Emily had been a writer by nature and inclination and skill, and her letters had life and memory in them. I wept a little rereading them. I'm more prone to tears at my age than I ever was in my prime and found myself somehow both angry with and grateful to whoever had sent that email claiming to be her. Which I suppose would put me in the frame of mind to respond when the next email came. I wasn't foolish about it. I didn't reveal anything about my finances or my address. I don't know that I would have revealed my finances to the real Emily had she been alive. She had peculiar ideas about money. But I typed a few words saying I was surprised to hear from her after all these years and hoping she was, under the circumstances, doing well. I don't know what I expected. The email stopped and I was pleased to have frightened off the Nigerian prince or Russian hacker before they could ask me to wire them an implausible sum, though this Smugness did not deaden the pang I felt every time I opened my email and did not see her name in my inbox. I retrieved the first message from the trash and placed both in a folder I named Dead Letter Office. And I read them over and over to the point where I could call to mind her voice, earnest and self-assured and full of fun, simply by hovering my cursor over the a voice I had not heard since some insipid phone call, probably, that neither of us knew would be our last. A few days after I resigned myself to the fact that Emily would not be writing to me again, I put the banker's box back on the shelf in the closet that had been my mother's. I prepared for another Christmas on my own. I sent old-fashioned cards to the same colleagues I sent them to every year before I retired at the beginning of November. I shopped for eggnog and a turkey breast and a microwavable box of creamed onions and bought a new pair of slippers and a necktie and a bottle of Glenfiddich. Old habits die hard, I thought. At least I didn't wrap them. Nor did I buy presents for the cats. Once or twice, I pulled my parents' greenbound copy of A Christmas Carol off the shelf and then put it back without opening it. The old moneylender was on the television every time I turned it on anyway. Bill Murray, George C. Scott, Mr. Magoo, Alistair Sim, of course. Our favorite had been the musical with Albert Finney. I watched a few minutes of it, but it hadn't aged well. Truth be told, I hadn't aged well either. There I was ready to spend Christmas, which happened to be my 67th birthday, in solitude. Again, with no particular plan for the day, just as I had no particular plan for my so-called golden years, other than watch a few minutes of an old movie every now and then and then turn it off grousing. I appeared ripe for the plucking. It was only my old lawyerly skepticism that had saved me from someone pretending to be my sister. I would need to remain on guard. The Nigerian princes would find me a worthy opponent, however. I am, as I mentioned, 
retired from the practice of law, comfortably set up due to some fortunate investments and a great many build hours, but my expertise lies uh, lay in trusts and estates, planning and wills. I am a master of the various strategies surrounding the disposition of one's mortal hordes, as well as the various tactics used to subvert the intentions of the deceased. My clients arrived with stock portfolios and art collections, jewelry and treasury bills, and the odd bit of worthless but beloved bric-a-brac. They arrived also with sycophants and connivers and long lost relatives, all reaching greedy fingers into well-lined pockets. My skill at portioning out assets in inviolable lock boxes of legalese made me quite sought after. And in truth, I approved of people thinking rationally about the future, fully aware of how easily their expectations could be dashed their influence over those they left behind would be in my hands and would consist of the distribution of dollars, not the clanking of ghostly chains. When Emily died, there was nothing to be dispersed. No savings, no box of belongings airmailed back to us. Everything we had of her was still in her childhood bedroom we already possessed all that there was and all that we thought there would be. My parents had threatened to throw away her things when she dropped out of college halfway through her sophomore year, but the threat was hollow. And while I don't think Emily at 19 would have cared, my parents would never have forgiven themselves if they'd done it, especially since her body was never found. As for my own fortune, such as it is, I was coming to the reluctant conclusion that I would have nothing better to do with my money but to leave it to my alma mater and the church my parents only occasionally brought us to. I'm not rich by the standards of my clients, uh, former clients, but I have a nice little nest egg that I needed to figure out what to do with, as I needed to figure out what to do with myself. I opened the whiskey on the evening of the 23rd, seeing no reason to wait, and ruminated on the year that was ending. The main event, for me at any rate, was being more or less politely pushed into retirement by a managing partner not much more than half my age, and my polite agreement to be pushed. It was time for something new. But what? I couldn't imagine. A retirement community in Florida? Perish the thought. My father had talked about retiring at 70 and died at 66, so I had no role model for superannuation. I pictured myself rattling around the family home, aimless and purposeless, until I became one of those old men who watches Fox News in the daytime. I became quite maudlin and self-indulgent and the occasional eerie lights and inexplicable noises, while decidedly not supernatural, did not help my mood. By the time I went upstairs to bed, I was utterly disgusted with my fatuousness. I was nothing to the disgust I felt when I woke up long before daylight, thanks to my aging bladder. I was sufficiently familiar with the phenomenon not to attempt to trick myself into going back to sleep without relief. So I grudgingly thrust my feet from under the duvet into my slippers, retrieved my bathrobe from the bed bedpost, I had of course set the thermostat to run lower while I slept, and shuffled down the hall to the bathroom. When I emerged, my half-closed eyes sensed an unusual glow along the wall of the staircase, and I'd forgotten to turn off a light downstairs before turning in. Gripping the banister, I made my way to the first floor. I froze on the step just above the bottom one, my foot in the air, and stared at the brown-haired young woman at the dining room table who looked something like my mother and something like a stranger. After an endless moment, she tilted her head to look at me. 
and it was Emily. I huffed out the breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding, spun around and stomped back to the bedroom. I shrugged out of my bathrobe and pulled the covers up to my chin, fuming at the goosebumps that refused to recede, even as my body warmed under the duvet. How dare my brain try to make a buffoon of me? It was no surprise, I reasoned, that Emily had been closer to the forefront of my consciousness after the fraudulent emails. Perhaps my night cap had been more generous than usual, given the quality of the whiskey and the permissiveness of the season. I struggled to erase the image from my mind and the unease from my chest, tossing and turning in frustration until the glow illuminating the walls of my bedroom was incontrovertibly the dawn. I spent that day in a fog and a funk for going the morning walk around the neighborhood, I'd been trying to incorporate into my routine now that I no longer had to get myself from house to train, from city station to office. I turned the television on and off a dozen times. For lunch, I heated some soup in a saucepan and ate it out of the pot like I was a 22-year-old 1L in my first apartment again. I changed the litter boxes and rearranged the stacks of papers on my desk. I stood and stared out the window blankly for long stretches. Eventually, in the afternoon, I fell asleep in my easy chair. I woke to a dark room in a dark world to match my dark mood. Emily was pulling cushions off the sofa and piling them on the floor. Hearing my snort as I startled awake, she chuckled and said, rise and shine, big. Hello, little, I croaked out, fumbling for the lamp next to me and switching it on. There was no sudden thunderclap or luminous aura. There was just my long-haired, long-dead sister standing in front of the cold and empty fireplace, wearing faded blue jeans and a peasant blouse, smiling at me with mischief in her eyes like, She'd done something clever and was going to make me admit it. She wasn't transparent or glowing or carrying her head under her arm. She had a mug of coffee on the mantel and it smelled like coffee. I tried to think of something appropriate to say and finally managed coffee. And she went into the kitchen and came back with a mug for me. You've changed some things, she said. You've also changed yourself. I'm not sure I like either. I sipped at the coffee to steady myself and tried to think of some way to word my disbelief. It has been 40 years, little. These cushions aren't the same. They're stiff. Does anyone even sit on this sofa? I shrugged helplessly. I've changed too. I know. I'm dead now, to begin with. She raked an appraising glance from my thinning hair to my worn-out slippers, not yet exchanged for the Christmas pair, although I'm not sure I would have enjoyed getting old. I wish you would have done it anyway. She reached for a mug and absently tucked her hair behind her ear in a manner that pierced me with both its familiarity and the realization that I'd forgotten it. You, you don't seem that different to me, Emily. Hmm. She rearranged the cushions again. Why, um, why are you, it's Christmas Eve, Big. You're going to read to me. Unless you're going to sulk off and ignore me again, as usual. I, come on, get in. She patted the mound of pillows. I've made it as comfortable as I could but I expect it'll take you a minute to settle your creaky bones. I frowned at her, suppressing a grunt as I shifted forward in my chair. Come on, I've got the book. I'm sorry, my brain seems to have settled along with my creaky bones. Are mom and dad here too? No, I mean, I don't see them. Or 
sense them supernaturally. She fluttered her fingers and widened her dark eyes, which is why I asked you to read, Big. Now move, or do I have to haunt you? Isn't that what you're doing? But I moved. I lowered myself into the sofa cushions in a nest before the fireplace, something I hadn't done since, well, since Emily didn't come home from college. The lumbar support was unexpectedly satisfactory. And then the fire sprang up, bright and crackling, and instantly as warm as if it had been burning for hours. Emily grinned and waggled her fingers again. Boo! Now read. She pushed the tall, green-bound volume into my hands. I opened it reluctantly and stared at the title page. It, too, had changed. Some particulars concerning the adventures of Emily N., age 19, amongst Los Desaparecidos, as told by herself. Little, I shut up and read. Just shut up, big brother, and read. I can't do both. Emily smacked my arm with a hand that was remarkably corporeal, considering. Part the Second. It was in the year 19 when Emily N. first learned of the plight of the peoples of the Third World. A dark-haired, dark-eyed maiden of 17, with all of the advantages of American society and wealth, she had left home to study literature and art with the other girls of her class. Her only brother had done the same some time before, he being six years her elder, though he was studying law as befitted a young scholar of his acuity and guile. Now it was her turn to enter the world through the gateway of education, prepared by her loving parents and provided with the greatest of comforts. It was not only the girls of her class who gathered at the Fount of Knowledge, however. Emily was to enter not only into the world of arts and letters, but the world of young men. It is, alas, a common story for a girl in such a situation to lose her head, uh, amongst other things. And our story will pass lightly over the events of her first year's studies until the time that she met Mr. Charles D. Uh, Charles had devoted his time in the Temple of Knowledge to philanthropic causes, mostly at a far remove from the American enclave in which he studied. He was strongest and fiercest on the weakest and most helpless objects of tyranny abroad, of which in those days there were many. He could see the downtrodden citizens of Sri Lanka more clearly than those of America, and the villainy in Jamba more clearly than that in Columbus. But that myopia, if strange, has always been common, at least amongst the sons and occasionally perhaps the daughters of privilege. If Emily noticed this optical condition at all, she considered it a minor infirmity compared to her own blindness in having arrived at the cusp of adulthood without observing these injustices at all. And besides, he was handsome and she headstrong. Thus it was that in November of 19, when Charles announced that he was leaving for Buenos Aires to join the dirty war on the side of the students and the trades unions, Emily announced in her turn that she would accompany him. Charles accepted her attendance upon him without remark. And so one morning, rather than gathering her school books and trotting off to her class in Victorian literature, she filled a backpack and a duffel bag with what she imagined to be essentials and hitchhiked alongside him to the airport. As they waited on the side of the highway, her frost-tinged breath clouding her view of the bell tower in the center of the campus from which they had walked, she had never felt so adventurous, so independent, so certain of her purpose. Even upon reaching that most colorful, corrupt, and crowded of cities after lengthy and increasingly fractious travel, Emily retained that exhilaration. Her faith in herself, and perhaps more surprising, her faith in her companion, survived the trip. Charles had not, it transpired, 
make provision for their arrival in Buenos Aires. However, with the fortunate combination of his charisma, her beauty, and their rudimentary Spanish, they found their way to a hostel whence they could commence their clandestine interrogation of the revolutionary demi -monde. And somehow, between them, they did come to make connections. Charles with the students and the agitators, and Emily, mostly, with the girls. What is it to be desperate? What is it to be desperate and poor? What is it to be desperate and poor and a girl? These are questions that Emily had discussed back home, but not really thought about. She had felt pity and outrage from a comfortable distance. She had not yet felt love for any desperate, poor girl. But that was what occurred that hot and humid December. She met girl after girl, woman after woman, in circumstances that were indeed pitiful and outrageous. And even through the barrier of language, her lessons had not prepared her half so well as she had thought. They were able to reach her heart. This chronicle will not detail the political and social unrest of that unhappy time and place. That story should be told by angels with trumpets, with fire and brimstone, with the judgment of the Almighty. This story is the story of one young woman who spent one year there, irrelevant to the tomes of the historians, irrelevant to the geopolitics of the secretary of this and the minister of that, much less the inspector general of the other. And she found of no interest to the makers of bombs and organizers of riots with whom Charles was spending his time. Indeed, as the months passed, she saw less and less of her idol and was less and less delighted by his presence when he graced her with it. She began even to contemplate the possibility that his obvious dissatisfaction with the resistance movement, with the lack of progress, with their shabby apartment, with the food, the language, the weather, with her, would lead him to leave her and return to America. The idea did not frighten her. His outrage had turned to anger, and his anger turned on everyone and everything he saw. The worst, she felt, was when someone expressed sympathy for her, for her. She was fine, happy even, bruised sometimes, yes, but what was that? She was not even lonely when he was away. She would sit all day on a stoop near the market and write letter after letter for whoever came and asked. And they did. She was Amelia now. Amelia Escriba sometimes, and sometimes Escribita. They still laughed at her, although her Spanish was no longer clumsy. And their laughter was warm and loving and lifted her heart. She knew the names they used on government forms and the ones they used with their grandparents. She knew what the doctors told them and she knew what the soldiers didn't tell them. She knew what they needed and did not have and what they wanted and sometimes did have. And sometimes, not every day, but sometimes she helped. A little. And she was proud of that. She was proud of Charles, too, in spite of everything. He would be away for days, and when he came back, she would ask where he had been and feel a tiny surge of admiration when he could not tell her. He was meeting with people he could not name, in places he could not disclose, doing things it was better for her not to have knowledge of. She had thought as their airplane rumbled over the brilliant bed of clouds towards her equally brilliant and unimaginable future, that she would be by his side throughout it all. But she assured herself that their toil was linked 
as their arms had been as they strolled their campus late at night. She made similar declarations in the letters home. She smuggled out of the city every few months, wanting her parents and her brother to be as gratified as she was by their endeavors. Sometimes when sleep was too long in coming, tired and aching as her body might be, she attempted to picture them receiving each bright and chatty missive, her whereabouts carefully concealed, her companions given only common Christian names or clever pseudonyms, the aims of the revolutionaries disguised by platitudes of freedom and justice for the downtrodden. She told them amusing stories about the food and nothing about sometimes going to bed hungry. She told them that her friends were fighting for a noble cause and nothing about her squinting at the page on which she was writing through a blackened eye. And when, after a year, she had a secret that she claimed as hers alone, she did not write of it. It was the women for whom she wrote letters who were the first to hear of this new chapter in her adventure among them. Most of them beamed, clasping her cheeks or laying their palms across her midsection, barely hardening under the folds of her skirt. They offered prayers to the Blessed Virgin. Emily concealed her amusement in the inaptness of the addressee and promised tinctures and tisans to soothe her disquieted digestion. One, however, older than the rest, clasped her arm instead and led her to the shadow of an alley. This baby, it is from Carlos. Yes, you're sure. Yes, Emily replied, her cheeks flushing with indignation and chagrin. You misunderstand. This baby, you are sure you wish to bring it into this world? The streets are not safe for a young woman whose belly is full. It is a hard thing you will be doing. And your Carlos, will he love a baby and its mother as much as he loves his dream of himself? The question hung between them in the suffocating heat. I can bring you something also, if you wish. It will not taste as sweet as theirs. It will also lead to a hard thing. You tell me, Amelia, but it must be soon. It is not difficult for a woman to hide a secret from a man who does not wish to know it, at least for a time. There are men, and not just men, who see more clearly what is further off and who see most clearly of all those things that have never existed. Emily had once found it romantic to disdain the things that were real and near and practical. But in this place and in this time, and perhaps in truth in all times and places, the tangible work of life, set to with fervor and goodwill, is as transcendent as the most high-minded of philosophies. Charles, when at last he was informed, seemed to accept the prospect of fatherhood with the same indifference with which he had allowed our heroine to travel with him to Buenos Aires. He did not offer to return with her to the Northern continent or to accompany her to a medical office, nor to a church. He did bring her a flower, which he pressed between the pages of a dictionary. And then he went away again on a mission he could not reveal to her and with people she had never met. Now she stayed indoors, in the shade, and her clients climbed the stairs to come to her. They brought with them small things, a piece of fruit, a ragged pillow for her back, a tiny embroidered bonnet. She wrote their letters for them as she always had and watched with wonder as every day some new aspect of the child within her revealed itself. 
Charles returned on Christmas Eve at night. She was awake and looking out through the window, smiling at the lanterns glowing with candles and wishes ascending to the sky. Then she saw him, standing in a shadow. He waited for a patrol to pass, then darted into the house. She ran to the apartment door and opened it, throwing her arms about him. But he did not return her embrace. His form rigid and unyielding. She stood back a step and hesitantly asked, what's wrong? And he struck her with his fist. The mission had gone badly, of course and he struck her. His friends had left him, and he struck her. He was done with this country, and he struck her. He was done with doing good, and he struck her. He was done with her, and he struck her. And then he struck her again, and again. There were no reasons anymore, there never had been. He was angry, and he struck her, and she was ashamed, and she was crying, and she screamed, and then his fingers were over her mouth, hot and filthy and tasting like blood, and then they were around her throat, and then she was silent. And then she was dead. Part the third. My hands and my voice were shaking so violently that the book fell to my lap. I turned to my sister and found her staring directly at me. One eye swollen and blackened, a trickle of blood at the corner of her cracked and purple lips. Dark, angry bruises blossoming above her collarbones. Oh, little, I whispered. I reached out a trembling hand to the wounds on her cheek. She grasped it and held it there, her eyes never leaving mine. And I watched in wordless despair as the mark slowly faded, though her skin remained icy under my fingers. I didn't... We never knew any of this, Emily. That's not what we were told. Emily released my hand and for the first time looked down, picking at the cushions. What did they say about me, Bing? After I disappeared? For a long time, nothing. No one said anything. Your Christmas letter never arrived, and then the birthday ne letters never arrived, and it was so, so quiet, little. I stopped asking Mom and Dad if they'd heard from you every time I phoned because I could tell how much it pained them to say no. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt them or you. I just, there were people who needed me more than you did, I thought. And you were right. In practical terms, you were right. You did things that mattered before. I wish I could say the same. But I also wish we'd known not to believe. Emily, we got a letter from Charles months later. I guess he tracked down mom and dad's address. He sent us a letter and it was all about how much he loved you and how it was so terrible what the junta had done to you and about how proud you would have been to be a martyr for the cause. It was the first time we knew for certain that you were never coming back to us, little. Emily pulled the book from my lap and hugged it to her chest, knuckles whitening around the spine. He went to the papers somehow. It was in the news for a bit. Pretty young American girl dead in a foreign country. Charles was still underground wherever he was, rallying people to his side in your name. Our senator issued a statement decrying the terroristic intentions of radical leftists, and held you up as an example of what happens to the misguided and foolhardy. Mom and Dad refused to talk to anyone about it. A reporter called me once. I said I had no comment and hung up because 
I had exams to focus on. And then something else overtook the story, as it always does. And well, it was just us again, without you. Emily nestled her head against my shoulder and laid an arm across my chest, the other still holding the book. I wrapped my arms around her. She had weight, substance, a faint patchouli scent. I knew that trying to warm her up was futile. Then an idea came to me. Do you want to see them, Little? See what? The newspaper clippings? Charles' letter? You saved them? We saved everything. Well, not your clothes or the baby dolls with their hair cut off or your hideous bedspread. But everything that we thought mattered, we kept. Emily sat up. You really still have them? I scrambled to my feet, displacing the pillows into an archipelago. I'll get them. Let me get them. Stay here. I stopped short, the chill left by Emily's arm along my flesh seeping into my bowels. You will stay, right? You'll be here when I come downstairs again. Emily didn't answer, her gaze drifting to the book she held, and my heart began to race. I dashed up the stairs, taking them two at a time until I reached the landing, at which point my lungs and my knees forced me to slacken my pace. I pushed open the door to my bedroom, which had once belonged to my parents, rushing in the way I used to and seeking them out after a nightmare. Not stopping to switch on the light, hands extended in front of me, I made my way to my mother's closet and felt for where I had replaced the banker's box a week or two before. There it was. No reason to expect it would have been otherwise. Clutching it in both hands, I descended the staircase as quickly as I could without the banister for support. I looked into the front room. There Emily was. Every reason to expect it would have been otherwise. She had reordered the cushions in my brief absence and was watching the cats who had wandered into the room and were lazily batting at each other. Iggy atop the coffee table, Juan below. My anxious breathing slowing, I crossed back to her and held out the box. You've changed the cats too, she said. Look, the box, I said foolishly. Kneeling, I set it between us. When she hesitated, I flung the lid off and plunged wrist deep into the papers and trinkets, heaping them in front of her. Emily laid her hands on top of mine, stilling my scrabbling. We saved, I think there's, thank you, she said. I withdrew and watched her as she sifted through the objects, smiling at the occasional drawing or knick-knack and building tidy stacks of papers. One for her childhood and a short time at college. One, the smallest, of the letters from her time in South America. And one of everything after. This was the pile she began to pour over with an expression that was familiar to me from childhood, that she lost herself in a favorite book or television show. She paged increasingly rapidly through the reports from newspapers and magazines until at last all that remained was the letter Charles had sent. She held the envelope with the very tips of her fingers, closing her eyes, then took a deep breath and slid the contents from inside. At that moment, one of the cats fled, yowling across the room, across the cushion nest, across Emily's lap, and out into the kitchen. The other sauntered after, brushing rudely past me without so much as a glance at my sister, off to seek its playmate. She unfolded the letter and laid her fingers on the jagged phrases that scrawled across two pages of cheap notebook paper, not keeping to the pale blue lines that ought to have organized his script. Then she began to read. As she perused the pages, marks flared again on her skin, blooming and fading in place after place, bruises, blood, a raw blister that might have been a burn, her face, her throat, even her hands, anywhere visible outside the contours of her clothing. I could not bear to think what might be happening beneath. The fleeting shapes echoed the flickering of the firelight across her body and my own hands ached to protect her. Emily came to the end of the letter and crumpled the pages in tight fists that dropped to her lap. 
The phantom wounds vanished, but her cheeks remained red and her eyes wet. Little. He lied, Big. We didn't know that, Little. You, in your letters, you never gave us any reason to think I wasn't lying, Big, or, oh, I had to, don't you see? You could have told us, I retorted, and then caught my breath as a wayward spark from the fire cast a shadow on her face, purple as a bruise. I flopped back against the cushion and admitted, maybe you couldn't have. Maybe we couldn't have understood. Emily slumped down beside me. I would rather have died than told you. I didn't want you to know. But I'm here because I needed you to know. And then we talked, talked for hours, telling each other our insidious fears and our close hugged achievements, taking each other seriously and teasing each other unmercifully, nudging each other in fits of giggles and holding each other in bouts of sobs. And finally, as I fought to keep my heavy eyelids open, Emily tucked her hair behind her ear and said, I'm going to go now, Big. I'm telling you this time. I struggled to my elbows. Will, will you come back, I asked. Emily laid her hand along my cheek. You of all people should know that I can't promise that. She leaned over and pressed a kiss to my forehead. Happy birthday, Big. And Merry Christmas. And then the fire went out. Part the Fourth. It was precisely a year ago, give or take an hour or two, that I woke on the floor of my living room on Christmas morning, cradled by couch cushions, a cat grooming itself indecently close to my head. The box's contents had been neatly returned, save one, the letter sent to us by Charles. I've always assumed it to be the source of the charred and brittle shards scattered on the otherwise empty grate of the fireplace. The tall, green-bound book was also back in its place on the shelf. And whenever I pull it down these days, it falls open to the page on which old Scrooge crows about crumbs of cheese and underdone potato. I've taken on new work. Not that different from my old work, really. My former clients used to worry about their things, mostly their dollars, being used in ways that they didn't like after they were dead. But it turns out that someone's life, someone's death, can be used against their wishes too. My new clients are already dead. I don't talk to them and they don't talk to me. I don't believe in ghosts, that assertion stands. I talk to some of the people they've left behind. I read their letters and I research their histories and I argue their cases in courts of various kinds, including the court of my own opinion. I tell their stories. It's not very lucrative, I'm afraid, but there are other compensations. I've not had very many clients yet. The ones I have had are not very good at recommending my services to fellow decedents, but I think I've corrected a few records. I picture my sister writing her letters for those Argentine women, making incremental enhancements to their daily lives as I write on each client's behalf. I did not take on the case of one Charles D., uh, who, yes, has died. A few Google searches and the reactivation of my LexisNexis account soon uncovered. On Christmas Day last year, in point of fact. Happy birthday to me indeed. He died in prison just to put a bow on it, having been arrested for vehicular homicide halfway across the country in the end. I don't think about him. 
I won't grant him that satisfaction even now. He liked it too much when people thought about him. I would rather think about Emily and people like her. And there are a lot of people like her I found. So many more than I ever knew. Perhaps one or two have made your acquaintance. Allow me to offer you my business card? The end. This has been a curious correspondence by Ed Bernstein and Melissa Shainer. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, if uh, you want to pass it along to any of your friends, this is the link, and we hope to post the text online soon. Thank you for joining me. A happy new year to all of you. Bye.